good morning, good day, and good evening. I'm as always your host, Brody Robertson, and today we have, I think you might be the first Colonel contributor I've had on the show before. Probably. Oh, cool. Definitely the first Meta employee, that's for sure. Uh, welcome to the show, <laughs> David Vinay. How's it going? Uh, it's going well. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, glad to be the possible first kernel contributor. In terms of like you know the order of titles, I usually put that one before meta employee, but mm -hmm. uh, but they're both they're both true. Yeah, but yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, it, I, I was just confused why you reached out to me, like because you know most of the time I will reach out to people about things. Hey, like oh you want to come talk about this? Usually people don't come to me with like a giant essay about the things they want to talk about. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you have a, a sizable audience. Um, I actually found your channel because you did that video on the uh, the, the six eight release cycle and how like Linus's power went out, mm, and there was yeah. that regression in the scheduler because um, there was some like firmware issue with AMD chips uh, with the frequency governor. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I have like I've I mentioned to you on the email, I have a Twitch channel, um, Twitch.tv/bytelab, that I'm trying to grow an audience for. So. I thought, hey, yeah, this guy's uh, obviously following kind of the low level stuff, so it might be nice to come on the podcast and uh, and chat. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to do this, so we'll see uh we'll see where it goes. Whilst I certainly like have an interest in that side of it as well, my knowledge is fairly surface level. Like I'm not a kernel contributor myself. I I will dig through the mailing list and like see what's going on. And when there are certain terms that come up, like you know, referring to I don't know, Skeddy XT, for example, I'll go like search documentation, find out what that's all about. But for the most part, like you are much more in the weeds than I will ever be with this situation. So I guess probably the best place to start is what is it that you mainly focus on? Because it seems like there is definitely a trend with what you are doing. So um, the first thing I focus on when I first started working on the Linux kernel, which was not the first kernel that I, that I worked on in my <laughs> career, um, I started working on live patch because at Meta we had an issue where when we were rolling out live patches, and for those of you who are watching, um, a live patch, if you're not aware, is a way that you can patch kernel text at runtime to fix bugs. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if you forget to drop a lock or you have a memory leak or something like that. And um, we were noticing that when we did that, TCP retransmit events were, uh, were going way up for like the few seconds it took to, 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 to do the patch. So anyways, I noticed that. Um, and I worked on that for a little bit. I fixed that bug, and that was kind of my like uh, my like test to get into the team. And since then, um, I've been focusing almost exclusively on the scheduler and BPF. Mm -hmm. And my day is usually a mix of um, uh, adding features to Skedex, running benchmarks, and trying to tweak things um, to make it better. Uh, I spend some time also in BPF, like I mentioned, on the uh, the standardization for BPF. I'm one of the two co-chairs. So reviewing documentation, uh, which is which is fun, but yeah, you know, it's it's as far as engineering gigs go, it's it's very, it's very like engineering focused. Like I don't really have too many meetings, which is nice, and uh, it's usually just yeah, just hacking on on the scheduler or BPF. Well, for most, I assume a lot of people watching this do have some sort of like technical background, but I don't know how many people really know about like these in internals of how a kernel works. So. What mm -hmm. is the scheduler and what does that actually do? Sure, yeah. So when you think of a system, you, you, what are you doing on your computer? You're on a web browser, you're on a word processor, you're doing a bunch of things at the same time. Mm -hmm. But um, the resources of your system are finite. You only have a certain number of cores or logical CPUs. And so the job of the scheduler is to decide who gets to run where and when. Um, so it's, you know, for example, if you have two cores and you have your web browser and your word processor, maybe the scheduler will say, oh, these guys both get to run in parallel on these two cores. But in reality, obviously, there's there's way more threads than that in the system. So the scheduler decides who gets to run where. It's a complicated problem because you have to deal with, with hardware issues. Like um, if you have a thread that's been running on a core, you probably want to keep it there if you can because it might have better cache locality. So its accesses will be faster because on the chip, there are these small, really hot caches that it wants to read from. Um, but if you keep it on the, the core for too long, then you might have another core that that could have run that thread that's just sitting there idle, not doing anything. Um, so you know that's that's sort of the problem space. Um, and then also with the default scheduler, especially EVDF and the kernel, um, fairness is a big problem. So you want to give everybody kind of their fair slice, their fair share of CPU. So how do you kind of balance all of these heuristics uh, while also making it 
generally fair. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the goal. So the the way the, the from the documents that you sent me, previously up until what six point four, six point six something in that area, the mm -hmm. scheduler was the completely fair scheduler, the CFS scheduler, and now it's using this EEVDF, the earliest eligible virtual deadline first. So right. Which is a really long name. I, I'd see why you said EVDF. It's a lot easier to say. Um, but what is, like, I know obviously explaining the intricate details of how they are different would probably take you the entire episode. But at, like, a, a surface level, what is, like, fun, uh, like, fundamentally different about these two approaches? So, yeah, that's a great question. I think it's, if you get into the weeds, it definitely takes a while to explain. But I think, you can, you can think about the scheduler like this. So if you have one CPU and you have all these threads that want to run on it, the basic idea is you want to count how much time each thread has run on that CPU. And you want to give the thread that has run the least amount of time the next slice of time to run. And that's called V runtime, like virtual runtime. Um, and that value, so, so if anybody's ever heard of uh, thread weights or thread niceness, the way that you apply that is you scale how much runtime you accumulate as the thread runs depending on its weight. So it's inversely scaled. So if you have a really high weight, you divide how much time you're accumulating by that. And um, essentially that's kind of the that's kind of the idea. It's fair because you're giving whoever has run the least amount of time scaled by their weight um, the CPU next. So between so that's really about bandwidth allocation, like who gets to run, how long do they get to run, et cetera. Um, but there's another problem in scheduling called interactivity, where you want to have, uh, you want to be able to give applications that have like latency sensitive requirements. Like if you're going to play a game and you're rendering some frame, uh, you probably need to render the frame quickly or else it's going to look jittery. Same with like calls and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And so there's stuff built into, there was stuff built into CFS to enable kind of more interactive workloads to be, to be given the CPU more, more easily. Mm -hmm. But the core difference with EVDF and CFS is that um, this deadline, eligible deadline that you mentioned, that's kind of where the interactivity comes along. Mm -hmm. And I'll try to give like a really brief overview. Um, I'm still confused by this. So if you're watching and you're confused, don't feel bad. But um, the idea is you have the same V runtime that you had with CFS, which is used again to count how much time you've run mm -hmm. for bandwidth to see who gets the CPU next. But in addition to that, you have what's called a deadline and if you're if you want to run for let's say 20 milliseconds your deadline would be however long you've run your v runtime plus 20 milliseconds and the idea is the scheduler schedules whoever has the earliest deadline first so if you have really short windows where you run you only run for like 100 microseconds your deadline is way sooner so the scheduler is more likely to pick you first because it's not just how how long you've run but it's also like when is your deadline so to speak and that's kind of more the interactivity part of it um, there's a really good LWN article that, that explains it, um, and maybe more intuitively than I am because the, uh, the LWN editor is, has been doing this for quite a while. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I would say, like the highest level explanation. So I guess with CFS, that came from a time, when was it? It was like 2006, 2007, somewhere in that range it was added to the kernel. Yeah, that's right. It was added. I think it was 2007, but it might've been 2006, but yeah, added a long time ago when when the, the hardware landscape was very different. Um, when you had cores that were much more homogeneous, so you had you know quad core systems that each had the same cache topology. You didn't have as many NUMA machines, um, and migrations were usually more expensive because the cores were spaced further apart. Mm -hmm. And so um, you mentioned this project Skedext, which uh, which allows you. I'm sure you're going to go into this a little Definitely, bit, but yeah. it allows you. Yeah, um, the TLDR is yeah. The, CFS was in a very different time, in my opinion. Like hardware is way more um, eclectic, let's say, than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So scheduling is more important than it used to be as well. Right. And I guess the kinds of workloads that we do on Linux nowadays are also fairly different as well. Like, you know, just a common example, like gaming, for example, like that wasn't really a, a use case for Linux back in 2006. There was, you know, the, a couple of open source games, but, you know, not like we have today. Right. No, it was a meme back in 2006. And now it's like, like we have the Linux Steam Deck. So Steam is like dead serious about Linux on uh, gaming on Linux. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's 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 a big scheduling problem. Um, there are people that are working on SCEDX that are looking closely at that problem specifically as well. And um, to give you maybe a concrete example. So um, I don't know if, if you've ever played Factorio or if any of your viewers have ever played Factorio. 
But um, it's a game where you have to build this huge factory that does all this stuff in parallel. So it's a very like parallel heavy game where you have to have a lot of computing power. And um, I think it was a non-tech did a benchmark where he ran on the uh, the 7950XD as, as I think the, the AMD CPU that has, um, it's kind of wild. It has a V, it has a 3D V cache sitting on top of one of its two uh, L3 caches. So if you imagine there's two different groups of cores on the CPU, there's a cache sitting on top of one of them, which means that that set of cores has better memory look uh, memory access. There's more cache around it, but it has um, it's it has to th uh, throttle itself more often because heat is actually trapped by that cache. So it's a really crazy scheduling problem. Where like on the one hand you have better locality, and the other you have better CPU. And on Windows it ran like way way better than on Linux because um, you know the, the Windows scheduler is kind of I guess it was more amenable to this type of workload. And so that's the kind of thing, that's an example of the kind of thing that we can we can do better um, in the modern age. So, okay, well, besides the interactivity problem, why would someone even care about changing the schedule? If it's, if it's this generic scheduler that just works well enough, like what sort of improvements would someone want to make to that to better suit their workflow? So... Well, yeah. So if you're talking about like the average person that's just using Linux, well, sure. um, yeah, you probably definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're yeah, they're probably they're probably going to going to be just fine with EVDF for the default. But mm -hmm. there's a few different types of users, I would say. So, um, so I'll give you an example from Meta. So we in, with HHVM, and if I'm going too deep into like the the crazy weeds, just let me know. Um, but with uh, before with you move HH... on, HHVM, yeah, what sure. is that one? Uh, Hip Hop VM. So that's the that's the PHP JIT engine that we use at Meta to run our web workloads. Um, if you laugh when I said PHP, that's totally fair. But this is um, this is a new type of PHP that's statically typed um, and has like tons of optimiza optimizations for jitting. So it's actually really fast mm -hmm. now. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things about JIT engines and compilers as well, actually, is that they have really really bad instruction cache locality. Mm -hmm which means that they're not really doing the same code a lot in like a row. They're going to this branch and this branch, and then they're compiling this code over here, um, especially with JIT engines. And so they have really, really poor front end CPU locality is the term for that. Um, and that means that they also have really poor IPC, which stands for instructions per cycle. And so a lot of the time when you're writing system software code, you want to try to use the CPU as efficiently as possible so that it can pipeline things and do a bunch of things at the same time. But with something like a JIT engine, it's really hard to do that because it's just it's just not really possible if you're like if you're if you're basically having to decode instructions every time you're doing something. So, in such a scenario, um, something like CFS, which is quite sticky because again, it's used to kind of it was built in a time when you had um when you had uh, cores that were further apart and it was more expensive to migrate. It doesn't really lend itself very well to that philosophy of stickiness because um, you actually just want to throw that thing onto a CPU. And just just let it go. Like you want to be able to run this thing as fast as possible. Maybe keeping it on the same CPU for cache locality like might be okay. But if you have a CPU and you're waiting around, then you should just throw it over there. So um, that's a, I sent a patch set for that actually upstream that hasn't been merged yet. But that's an example of like where we want to make the scheduler more work conserving is the term for that. So it's it's a, it's just doing it's 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 erring on the side of doing more work as opposed to kind of improving locality or these kinds of things. Um, right. And there's, I mean, there's so many things. Like, <laughs> we have we have a ton of SCEDEX schedulers already that are all that are all cute and eclectic in their own ways. Um, and I can certainly give you really interesting examples if you're if you're interested in more. Yeah, if you have some, before we get like deep into what SCEDEX is specifically, if you want to give those examples, we can do that. Sure. Yeah. So here's another one. So um, so VMs are interesting. Hype, like if if you're talking about a VM, the way that the scheduler views a VM is by uh, what are called vCPUs or so virtual CPUs. And so in the guest operating system, you have obviously whatever threads have spawned in this guest OS. But from the perspective of the host, the, the threads of the VM are just its actual CPUs that are running, which, which kind of makes sense if you think about it, right? Because you're, um, the, the guest OS has CPUs. It's scheduling stuff on those CPUs. But it's the actual host OS that decides when those CPUs get to run, right? It's multiplexing the, C, the, the physical CPUs to these virtual ones. Um, and that's fine if you're working on like an overcommitted environment, which is obviously not uncommon at all for VMs. But for a lot of workloads, like on AWS or on, on a lot of cloud providers, 
you can imagine that it actually might be better to give us a vCPU, uh, uh, an actual physical core, and just turn off timer interrupts. Basically, do everything you can so that you never interrupt the guests at all. Um, it's a little, it's pretty expensive to exit the guest. It's called a VM exit, and it's there's hardware is doing a lot of stuff. It's it's not cheap to do, so you want to try to avoid that. So, um, you could, for example, build a scheduler where all scheduling decisions are made from a single core, mm -hmm. where you're not running a, a, a guest vCPU. And you just let the vCPUs burn on the core. You're not no timer interrupts, nothing that would pull it out of the uh, the guest. And um, if you need to actually do a reschedule, you're like oh something needs to run there. There's like a K thread, a kernel thread that needs to do some I/O or something like that. Then you can send what's called an IPI, inner processor interrupt. And there's a specific one called a reschat IPI. It's designed for making it do a reschat. And you send it from the one core that's actually doing the scheduling and kind of organizing everybody. And um, that works, right? Because you don't really need to do very many scheduling decisions in real time like you would with a normal scheduler. And you also you kind of take the scheduler and the host out of the way of the guest. And you can actually have really big speed ups in cloud environments by doing that. So when you're dealing with these, like dealing with schedule, uh, when, you're, when you're at the point of dealing with scheduler problems, you're sort of at this point where you've optimized the code and you've got this giant deployment. It's like, okay, how do I further optimize it from here like how do i get the absolute most out of the hardware i have you probably wouldn't approach the problem anywhere before that point yeah so yeah um <laughs> that's funny you should ask that because before i was doing this kind of work i kind of was like what is left to do like um what for example something i hear a lot from people is like oh kernel compile is like optimized completely there's nothing left to do for kernel compile which is untrue you can we could do better for kernel compile believe it or not um, and so how do you go about fixing or improving something that's been like banged on repeatedly and relentlessly for so long? Well, the good news is um, hardware is extremely, extremely complex, which, which gives people like us a job. Um, and so to give you an example, earlier I was, uh, I was talking about the front end CPU pipeline and how, uh, how that is sort of really slow when you're doing like a JIT engine, JIT workload. Well, to go into a little bit more detail to kind of make that make sense, one of the parts on Intel CPUs, at least, one of the parts of that is called the um, the uh, the DSB, the decode stream buffer, mm -hmm. which takes instructions like x86 instructions, and will will uh, compile those into into uh, microcode into like risk instructions, which are actually what run in the back end of the CPU, mm -hmm. and it'll cache those so that um, it doesn't have to do that decode every time. And that's one of the things that thrashes a lot if you're doing a JIT engine. But um, that thing, this decode stream buffer, if you look at the Intel CPU for like the Skylake microarchitecture, it's like, okay, if you have three, it's actually like this well specified or like this no logic specified. If you have like three unconditional branches within a 32 byte window, then like you always, you always have to use a new entry in the DSB. And there's all these like really particular hardware specific things that have nothing to do really with the workload. And um, there are times where like you might pad out your code by like a little bit and then you get this huge like 10x speed up on your on your program. So that kind of thing, you know, is is always there's huge, I think, I mean, a lot of the time there's huge gains to be made from that. Um, now, talking about the scheduler specifically. Uh, so we've talked about sort of like hardware hardware related stuff, but there's also a lot of software related things that we don't really take into account now with CFS mm -hmm. or EVDF, but in the future, and I'll talk about this more when we get to SCEDX, but um, you can imagine if you have like a service where you have one thread doing a lot of IO that's reading an RPC message or remote procedure call message. So I got a request, you know, like you want, you want like a cat photo. I'm going to take your message, demarshal it into something that I can run on the server and then pass it off to like a worker thread to actually do the work. Well, you probably want to put the worker thread on the same core as the IO thread because the IO thread just pulled the whole message into cache, right? So it's hardware related still, obviously, because it's still talking about caches, but it's um, it's really kind of, you have to understand the application. It's more of like a, it's it's you're kind of getting a little bit higher level than the kernel even at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to, I'll stop monologuing in a second. Um, but you know, in general, when I'm just going in to, um, to attack a problem, I'll usually first look at IPC, instructions per cycle, which is kind of a good metric of how well are you using the, 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 the core. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll start to look at like what else is kind of going right. If it's lower than I expect, all right, like, like where are we stalling? Are we stalling in memory loads? Is like IO the bottleneck? Are we just compute bound? We just need more cores. Um, 
and you know you it's it's sort of a process of elimination from there yeah. mm -hmm. so one thing you did touch on earlier in there that i do want to get back to is it sounds like when you're dealing with these scheduler problems it's going to be very platform specific like if you are dealing with like a skylake cpu if the architecture changes a bit with the next generation you might want to restructure how that scheduler is uh, being used to better suit that specific platform you've moved to yep that's right so a lot of it is compiler st like compiler level like um there are there are a lot of bugs you'll see like with, with lvm or with gcc where it's like like i was saying oh if we pad this out a little bit more when we emit the code it's much better performance on this micro tech micro architecture or that one but it's absolutely also a scheduling problem and um, a good example of that would be AMD, I would say. Um, on uh, one of the earlier Zen microarchitectures, you had what's called an AMD ROM. Um, and the AMD ROM um, had a very different latency uh, distribution for accessing memory outside of your L3 cache compared to the next generation, which is called Milan. And now the modern generation is called Bergamo, and things are just getting huge and huger and huger. Um, so you know, with all of these things, like for what I was saying about like aligning text and that kind of thing, that's really more of a compiler problem. But, mm -hmm. um, but the point is, right, like all of these little things, there, there's so many details like that in, um, in, a, in, in a CPU. And, um, you know, you have to just like every part of the system kind of has to play, but the scheduler is scheduler is a really, really big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. for something like, like these big Bergamo machines and AMD that have like hundreds of cores and stuff like that. Mm hmm. So I guess we probably should get into Skeddy XT then. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of a lot of terms we need to go over as we do this. But no problem. <laughs> at a high level, what is Skeddy XT and what problem is it trying to solve? Okay, so um, Skeddy XT is a new pluggable scheduling framework, um, and the idea is it lets you implement your own scheduling policies, your own host-wide scheduling policies. Um, and implement them as what's as what are called BPF programs. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, when I say host wide, what I mean is um, these are threads. If you are running in CFS or EVDF, you instead bring them over to your scheduler. If you have like what are called real time threads or deadline threads, these threads that are running these higher priority schedule, scheduling classes, those don't those don't run in your scheduler. They stay in the kernel. But you migrate all of the the other default threads to yours. Now, so that's the host wide part. Um, the BPF part, so BPF stands for a Berkeley packet filter. And that originally, if you ever heard the term, you may have heard it in terms of packet filtering, as you might imagine, which was added to the kernel quite a while ago. But since then, um, something called what, what many people call eBPF, extended BPF, has been added, which is completely different. And that lets you run a, a JIT inside the kernel, which is insane when you think about it. But you can. There's actually an instruction set for BPF. There's there's BPF specific encodings for instructions. Um, there's a backend for the LLVM compiler where if you have C code, it'll compile the C code into BPF instructions, and then it, and uh, at runtime, you know, throughout the runtime of the kernel, the kernel will read that BPF bytecode and um, emit x86 instructions or whatever architecture you're running on to run the actual program natively in the kernel. Um, and there's a couple of things that are special about that. So first of all, um, kernel modules also do something similar for anybody who's heard of those before, but there's, they're very different than BPF programs for a number of reasons. For example, BPF programs can't crash the kernel. Uh, the kernel will statically analyze the BPF program in a component called the verifier. And if the program could be unsafe, like you're reading a pointer that you shouldn't read, or, um, or you're, uh, you're not dropping a reference, like you, you have a memory leak or something like that, it won't let you load the program. Um, and um, it also has all sorts of ways of interacting with user space from your BPF program. Like there are these data structures called maps where you can have in real time shared memory that you, that you can write and read from both user space and kernel space. Um, and so obviously there's a, lot of, there's a lot more to say, way more to say about BPF, but the basic idea is it's a safe environment for running uh, dynamic, dynamically loading and running programs in the kernel. And SCEDX is a framework that uses BPF to implement host-wide scheduling policies that are also safe and can't crash or can't hang the, the machine either. Mm -hmm. Now, as yeah, as far as why, what, what problem is it trying to solve? Well, um, so EVDF, CFS, these are, these are general purpose schedulers. 
um, they do really well for for what they do, right? Their general purpose. They they're fair. They have a lot of. They've been worked on for many many years, and they're very well optimized. Um, but there's a few drawbacks. Uh, for one thing, um, I don't know uh, for any of any of the viewers who have ever done kernel work before. You know how much fun it is to compile a kernel, reinstall it, reboot it, and then you have a bug where you crash something or you corrupt your your disk or your file system, and you're like, great, I have to do all this again. So the the safety aspect is really nice. You know, for a BPF program, you recompile it. It takes like two seconds to compile, and then you just rerun it, and you the kernel loads it, starts running it for you. It loads it in, does everything under the hood to, to transition the whole system to using it, and it just runs. So you know, for Meta, if we're if we're like running an experiment on on thousands of hosts, it's it's just not even an option for us to do like this iteration where we're we're loading a kernel onto thousands of hosts, waiting for the caches to warm back up. Then doing measurements and oh, it crash or like what's different about this and whatever. So, so it makes it, it about as simple the, as like, you know, testing a regular user space application. Oh, you just compile it, run it, it just goes. It's literally that easy. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I guess, a little bit different because it has host wide implications, but it's in terms of the, the, the iteration time. Yeah. It's exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, the other big problem it solves uh, is that you do leave a lot of performance on the table for, for a general purpose scheduler in certain scenarios. Um, and so, you know, for us, we have Meta as, a, as an easy example. We have a lot of large services that are kind of monoliths, like web, um, stuff like that. And so we, there's just too much scale for us to kind of leave the, the scheduling on the table, the scheduling benefits we can get on the table. And um, you know this allows us to build scheduling policies that that just aren't appropriate even to be merged into a general purpose scheduler. So things that like would never be able to get upstream, we can build them in SCEDEX as well, <laughs> and um, and use them internally. Um, and then yeah, the crazy ideas like the like the uh, the vCPU like uh, cloud cloud computing thing that I was talking about earlier, that stuff as well. Like, it enables you to do that. So you could like make your own scheduler even without something like this. It would just be a lot more of a slow iteration process that would just just not be suitable in, especially in cases like this uh you could I, I wouldn't recommend it because it's um the api for building these schedulers in the kernel is very complicated and it requires you to understand kind of the core logic of the scheduler like think like callbacks will be called in different contexts and you have to understand what context you're being called in for something to make sense um, so you can do it like Google's written some schedulers, like lots of companies have, but if this is something that you're interested in, I, I would, I mean, I'm biased, but I really wouldn't recommend doing that. I would recommend looking at SCEDEX. It's going to be a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Um, the callbacks are, are like, we, we also tried to make the callbacks and the API, like much more kind of intuitive and, and reflecting the policy instead of kind of the system around it. Right. So is there some sort of performance overhead of this approach obviously there's going to be some but like is it a obviously if you wrote your own you would be you know directly interacting with it you, you wouldn't have this extra thing here maybe i'm explaining this badly um but like what sort of overhead does come with sketty xt there's a much better way to say it oh that that's it's a really really good question and um there is an overhead so when you when you go with something like with a, with a bpf scheduler you have to take the overhead of of, um, of going through the BPF interface, which is, means doing like indirect calls and stuff like that. Um, so there's certainly an overhead to, to doing it in SCEDEX. Um, it's really minor from what we've seen. It's like a couple tenths of a percentage overhead relative to just using a native scheduler. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it's it's pretty hard to, to get over that that hump, depending on what you're what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and certain things, you know, something like EVDF is like super well suited for it. So there's just no point in even trying uh, unless you wanted to build it in SCEDEX itself. Um, but yeah, it's it's a couple tenths of a percent. So, you know, pretty like pretty low. And, th and the reason it's so low, something I should probably make clear is that BPF is not a user space framework. Like when you implement a scheduling policy in BPF, the kernel is actually calling directly into your program and staying in kernel space. You can build user space components on top of that. And we actually do have schedulers where we have like load balancing done in user space, but the hot paths, everything stays in the kernel. There's no up, there's no like handshake with user space or anything like that. And so um, the overhead is really is really minimal, um, and you know the, the trade off obviously works out quite well in a lot of scenarios. For anyone unclear about it, what does a load balancer do? Another great question. So um, I'll try to give a quick overview of this as well. So. 
if you imagine load is in simple terms, load is just how much stuff is running on a system. So if you have like two threads that are always runnable, um, then you know you might have load of 200 because the default weight for a thread is 100 and load is weight times basically how long the thread can run for. Now, if you imagine a really complex system, which obviously most of them are, even if your machine is sitting idle, there's K threads running and all this stuff. Um, the goal of a load balancer is to balance load across the system. Um, and the thing I said earlier about EVDF, where you have this V runtime per core, where you count how much time each thread is run, that's from the perspective of a single core. So each core has its own run, its own run queue and has its own counter of V runtime. Um, and so within a specific core, everything is fair. But when you go between cores, and especially when you go between what are called scheduling domains, so like between cores that are grouped into L3 caches, at that point, you have to use this sort of higher level view of load to try to balance the system. And that's kind of what, yeah, that's what the load balancer is doing. Right. So I don't know where I was going to go with that, actually. <laughs> well, so I, I, I can go into a little more yeah, detail. No, if you want to, I, there was some, I had something there. It just, it just <laughs> Dude, it's stuff, stuff is so complicated. Um, so yeah, like, okay, you imagine you have, you have two cores, four threads. Right. And three of the threads are running, um, you know, a third of the time. Uh, actually, let's keep it simple. They all run 100% of the time, and they all have the same weight, and they're all in one core. And that means that one of the two cores has has load of 400 because you're just adding it up, and the other one has load of zero. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to distribute this load evenly, right? Yeah, every thread should be getting its proportion of compute capacity mm -hmm. relative to its proportion of load. And so what I mean by that is if the total load in the system is 400 amongst these four threads, each of them have load of 100, which again is weight times how long it can run, weight times duty cycle, then they each get 100 over 400 equals a quarter of the compute capacity in mm -hmm. the system. And so there's two cores. So each of those cores should get 200, should be responsible for 200 load each. And so the load balancer would say, oh, there's 400 on this core, zero on this core. They should each have 200. So I'm going to move two of the threads over. And now they each have 200. And the system is fair. The system is balanced. That's mm -hmm. That's essentially what it's doing. So, okay, so the load balancer is there to make sure the work is distributed across the different threads, and then the scheduler is there to make sure the work that is there gets a suitable, uh, suitable amount of time for those individual tasks. Yeah, well, so, so the scheduler is both parts of it. The scheduler's job is to both distribute load amongst cores mm -hmm. and also to ensure fairness on a, a specific CPU or interactivity. Um, if you look at the actual scheduling code, the uh, the load balancer is like kind of in its own thing. Like you do it, you do it after some amount of time, or when a core is going to go idle, it might pull load onto the core. Um, but but it's, it is both both of those things are, are certainly part of the scheduler. And um, you know, for example, like you, the scheduler has to scale to like thousands of cores for some huge machines. So you'll accumulate load within a specific within a single core, and then when you load balance, you'll sum the core. Sorry, you'll sum the load between them. You know, from one core, whichever one is load balancing. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's it's confusing because it's sort of they're both kind of related to fairness, but they're very different ways of looking at it, and there's very different problems with each of them. Mm -hmm. um, but it is both of both of them are the scheduler. You mentioned that someone could implement the uh, load balancer in user space. Why would somebody want to do that instead of doing it in kernel space? So you you it's another great, great question. So uh, there there are advantages and drawbacks of doing it. So if if you do everything in the kernel, the advantage is of course that you don't have to go to user space, right? You do everything in the kernel. Um, it's all fast. It's all right there, but the kernel has some enormous drawbacks. Uh, for example, you can't do floating point math in the kernel. You have to do only fixed point math. Okay. Um, the registers for doing floating point aren't aren't used in the kernel. So um, if you wanted to do like like load balancing, I was saying, you know, we're doing division, right? We're we're talking about the pr proportion of load that one thread is using across the system. And so like this is this is like a floating point. Like everything is done in percentages and fractions. So. Um, it's, it's nice to do it in user space because that's kind of the component that's really complicated. Mm -hmm. And um, the complexity of doing it in the kernel, you probably could do it in BPF, um, but but you know, you're know you only running the load balancer like in, this, in one of the schedulers we have, you only run it once every two seconds. You don't really need it to be in the kernel. Right. Um, and you, know, you can do, you can really go crazy. Like balancing load is one thing, but you could look at, um, you could look at like, if you have asymmetric CPU capacity, like one of them, like the one that I was talking about earlier, the 7950X3D, where you have the V cache and then you have the, the other thing. 
Like all of these things you could just, you can model in whatever way you want. You can do machine learning from user space and make predictions. You can classify like what thread, what, what quality of a thread would maybe suit it better for one domain or the other. So um, sort of the, the core to, to sort of summarize the core algorithm, like you probably could do it in user space, but it's just very limiting. You know, it's a very difficult environment to program in. Oh, you mean you could do it in kernel space? I, I said, yeah, I'm not sorry that you could do it in kernel space. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but user space is easier. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sure most people have heard the terms user space and kernel space before, but we should probably just quickly explain what that is as well, along with why there is this issue with like swapping back between them and why that comes with some sort of performance degradation. Sure. So user space is the part of the computer that you're using, like when you're using a computer, like when you're in a web browser, that's a user space program. When you're, when you're using, um, you know, like SSH, that's user space. And the idea with user space is um, every every process has its own virtual address space, right? It has its own kind of virtual fake view of memory. Um, and that's uniform for every process in the system. Um, your job is to do something, whatever the program is doing, and that's about it. Um, excuse me, kernel space is the component of the system that manages all of that stuff. So, you know, in reality, um, memory is not virtual, right? Memory is physical. You have some amount of, of RAM on the system and the kernel has to map is the term virtual memory to this physical, this physical memory, this RAM. Um, you, you have something like the kernel, the scheduler, excuse me, where you're, where you're deciding which, which threads, which processes get to run on which cores, you know, this is something that has to kind of be in the core of the system. And so if you imagine that user space, everything is its own process, its own application. The kernel is like that. The kernel has its own monolithic address space. Every thread in the in the kernel is 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 in the same little sandbox, but that sandbox is like the management of the system. It's it's distributing resources. It's it's multiplexing things on on finite resources, um, and it's it's the privileged component, right? You you wouldn't want one malicious thread to be able to give itself all of the runtime in the scheduler, so. Yeah, I mean, that's a very high level description, but hopefully that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, you also asked like about the, the transition between the two. Yes, yes. So when you go between user space and kernel space, um, that's that's an operation where you're changing address spaces, you're changing privilege levels, all this stuff, right? Like when you're in, so I don't know if, if anybody ever ever heard of these, uh, these horrible vulnerabilities called Spectre Meltdown that happened a few years ago. Yeah, those are fun. I, I hope they've heard that. about them. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, for like, taking Meltdown, because that's a pretty easy one to talk about. So that was a bug where, so the kernel memory is is protected, right? Like if you have a user space process, it shouldn't be able to look at the memory of another one. Like that's a secret, right? Like that would be a bug if you were able to read some remote process's memory, which makes sense. Um, and so when you go between user space and kernel space, a lot of things are happening in hardware that change the execution context. Your registers, the, the user space registers are being saved on the stack. Um, you're changing what the instruction pointer to point to somewhere in the kernel. You're loading kernel registers. You're probably going to change to a kernel thread stack as well. You have to copy memory from user space. Um, again, you're changing privilege level. So all this stuff, um, that's called trapping into the kernel. That's the term for it. All of this stuff um, happens every time you go back and forth between the two. And um, Linux is a monolithic kernel, right? So like when you trap into the kernel, there's a lot of layers to go down before you get to the scheduler, for example. It's a pretty core part of the operating system. Mm -hmm. So um, if you were to say, okay, well, who's going to run on this this CPU next? I, I don't even know if it'd be possible to do this. But if you imagine before you make that decision, you schedule your user, actually, it would be possible. You schedule your, your user space process that's running on this CPU. You schedule it. And it goes, okay, who's going to run next? Uh, these guys, this guy's, okay, we'll run this, this person next, this thread next. And then it traps back into the kernel. It goes back into the scheduler and it says, okay, this is the one to run next. And that's the one that you put on the core. So that's like, that's like way more overhead than if you just look into a, a kernel space map, right? It's, mm -hmm. you're talking like orders of magnitude more overhead to do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, there actually is a SCEDEC scheduler that um, somebody at Canonical is working on um, that's doing really, really well. Cause he's, he's, he's uh, been able to really push it pretty far, but uh in practical terms, um, there's there is a lot of cost to doing that. Mm -hmm. But then the issue you have with doing things in kernel space is you can cause serious issues, like because it is a monolithic kernel, things might you know really bad code can take down the entire kernel. Yeah, 
Yeah, really bad code can. It turns out the code that we thought wasn't bad can also do it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, now, with, within a SCEDEX program, within within a BPF program, theoretically, you're not supposed to be able to take the host down. And if, if that would happen, then it should be it should fail to even be loaded in the first place. But for sure, to your point, more broadly, absolutely, it's a big kernel space. is like it's a tricky it's a tricky place to be doing programming in. It's good, you know, within reason. It's good to try to push complexity out of the kernel when you can. Um, and you know, if you look at a lot of the kernel the kernel algorithms for how it implements stuff, like the heuristics are off, often probably more simple than you would imagine. Like for prefetching IO, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think it was a static amount that you prefetch. Um, there's no like tracking. I might be wrong about this, but uh, the last time I checked, I think that was what it was. I don't think there's any tracking of like, how much are we reading? Like, oh, we've been reading a lot. Well, like we should prefetch more because we're expecting it to be reading this whole file. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff that you could do with like math and kind of, kind of more complicated reasoning and models about how things work, you really don't see that very often in the kernel. And, and the scheduler is actually probably the most complex part of the entire kernel in that regard, mm -hmm. like how much it has in the kernel directly. Um, but yeah, in general, it's it's uh, it's it's not a great place to to be doing that. You said theoretically the BPF program shouldn't be crashed in the kernel. I'm I think it's fair to assume that there were some issues along the way where they were crashed in the kernel. Yeah, sure. I mean, it it happens. You know, it's especially like if there's a new release and there's some big feature that like some we haven't seen a corner case. It happens. Um, so far, we haven't. I'm gonna knock on wood, but we haven't had any like big issues rolling it out to in, in Meta. Um, and uh, but yeah, you know, we we're, we're working on it. People are finding stuff. The, the community around the project has actually grown a lot in the last few months, uh, which has been really cool. And with more eyes on it, you know, somebody, for example, opened a, a bug today because on the stable release of the kernel, if you try to use um, what's called conflow, uh, control flow integrity, this feature called CFI, which basically makes sure that you're always calling a safe function in the kernel, um, that it would crash the SCEDEX. And it was because some patch set that was never merged to the actual stable kernel, which it probably should have been, um, we, we didn't know that it wasn't merged. And so we just told people like, yeah, just don't use the stable release because nobody's really using it that, uh, that often anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah yeah absolutely there's i think uh anybody who works in any part of software that tells you that there's never problems is uh, is, is being a little bit uh disingenuous i don't know how i didn't ask this before but how long was uh or how long has skedex been a work in progress for um it's been in work in progress for about two years at this point mm -hmm. um another another engineer at, at meta um it was kind of his his brainchild and he worked on it for for about six months and then i came onto the project um shortly after i joined the team and did the live patch stuff and uh it's been what i've been working on ever since um yeah so it's it's been a good amount of time um relative to a lot of other huge open source projects that are kind of contentious to get merged upstream it's it's you know it's not like the longest by far they like the the like the preempt RT patches is one everybody talks about that's taken like 25 years to get merged. We're hoping that we're hoping that's not going to be the case. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's uh, it's also been quite a while that we've been we've been working on it, iterating on it, building a community around it until uh, until and then obviously after it gets merged uh, mm -hmm. to the main Linux repository. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed in one of your talks that I don't think you touched on in the talk was the uh, GPL v2 requirement. Hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, so GPL v2, that's the license that the kernel is licensed with. And um, another BPF feature is it'll it'll look at the binary of the BPF program. And if that, that program is not licensed with GPL v2, which is emitted in the metadata for the program in the binary, then the verifier will just fail to load it if it's a SCEDEX program. Mm -hmm. um, that was the reason. I mean, we, we added that because we wanted we wanted everything to be to be GPL v2. We wanted it all to be open sourced. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, more than that, um, there were there were some concerns in the community that this would maybe uh, this would maybe stifle uh, upstream contributions to the scheduler and stuff like that and you know we we certainly don't want that we obviously still use EVDF internally at Meta and um, and it's a great scheduler so this is just one of our ways of saying like hey you know people still have to open source them and we can we can take whatever crazy ideas that work really well in SCEDEX and we can add them to uh, to the fair scheduler as well if we want to. Mm -hmm. Well, that, yeah, that makes sense. I because I, I heard that I was, I was confused why, because I, I don't think you mentioned why there was like that at least in the talk that I heard. Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 a tricky topic because people, 
people have really strong opinions. Like, I don't know how much you, you looked at like kind of the, the conversations on the upstream list, but some of them got a little heated. Mm -hmm. Um, some private conversations did too. And that's, that's fine. I mean, like I get it, you know, there's, it's not, nothing is ever black and white, but, um, so, you know, if I, I if I didn't mention that it was, it was because it, I didn't think it was necessary. Like, like th the fact that it's GPL V2 is, is its own fact, right? Like, okay, now we know that it's GPL V2 and, if right. you have concerns about upstreaming, then okay, you know, that's fair. But at least, at least theoretically, you know, this shouldn't, this should be something that we're protected against by GPL v2, at least. Mm -hmm. So we should probably move on to the second thing you mentioned, uh, co-chairing the BPS standardization. Oh, yes. So uh, before that, uh, you're doing that with the IETF. I, I'm sure the very tech nerds know about the IETF, but there's probably another one that people don't know who that is. Oh, you have to be like a special kind of tech nerd to be to be up in the IETF. So IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, is is a standards body that has that has created standards for a lot of different parts of the the internet, like um, BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, Quick, like all the a lot of old TCP IP packet formats and stuff like that. Um, so they're they're you know a very robust excuse me, well-respected um, standards body. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we wanted to, we, we shopped around for which which standards bodies we wanted to go with. And, and uh, we had no, I, I've never standardized anything. I don't think anybody else in the BPF community had. So uh, we decided on the IETF because they had a lot of experts there to help us do it, right? Mm -hmm. So what was the, um, well, I, I did see in the document that BPF is also used outside of the kernel as well. So I guess that's why yes. it's, it's a concern for it to be standardized. Um, so that's one of the concerns. Yeah, it's there's something called UBPF, which is user space BPF. Mm -hmm. um, like I was mentioning earlier, BPF has its own instruction set. So if you compile into BPF bytecode, mm -hmm. theoretically, it could run like any other JIT. You know, it could be cross-platform, just like a JVM program mm -hmm. could run across any platform, theoretically. Um, so we wanted to standardize for software reasons. Uh, the big reason, though, is because there are, there are hardware vendors that are building support for offloading BPF programs to devices as well. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a big, big investment for companies that do that. And uh, there have been companies already, like a company called Netronome, that's built BPF offload even without the standard. Um, but, but that's a little bit of a special case. And so we, we've been hearing from vendors that this is something that they want. This is something that they kind of need before they'll actually be willing to invest the money in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like a, a lot of the trend of this, the tech industry right now is going towards offloading, like uh, for networking, offloading uh, TLS, um, like transport layer security. So you're doing encryption and decryption on the actual NIC itself instead of having to go all the way to the CPU to do it. Um, yeah, you know, it's with like now that now that we're not doubling our compute capacity every eighteen months, these kinds of things are what we're sort of where we're going. And so BPF, um, you know, I think it's a really nice middle ground between having nothing and having an ASIC that costs like a billion dollars to build. So, uh, you know, hardware is hard. Um, it's hard for us to predict what what we should be standardizing to accommodate hardware without kind of making it hard too hard for them and also giving them kind of the guardrails to to build something that that's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, that's the idea. It's, it's, I, th I think more, more than software, it's definitely for the hardware vendors, but everybody does benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that definitely makes sense. Uh, how long has this been in progress for? Uh, let's see. This has been in progress officially since I think March, 2023. Oh, it's fairly new. Thing, um, then. It's pretty, it's pretty new. Yeah. Yeah. And so, there's um there you can actually Google like the BPF IETF working group and we have this this charter where we have all of these documents that we that we're intending to write some of them are standards documents others are what are called informational documents so they're basically mm -hmm. like our suggestions for like ABI and whatnot but they're not actually standards that you need to follow um, but it's pretty new yeah and we're we're pretty close to going to last call for our the instruction set standard the the ISA standard. Um, and that's the first that that'll be the first document. So we're we're really excited for that. Um, but you know, if that goes if that continues to go well and we find that we need to keep going, then this is this is gonna be like a long process. I don't know if I'm gonna stay as chair the whole time. I don't know if I have the the energy for that, but uh, but it'll it'll be yeah, it'll be a long, long road for sure. So has there been any obviously you can't say anything that maybe is 
you know, off the books, not allowed to say it, but like, has there been any sort of pushback with the approach to standardization or the idea of standardization or anything like that? Actually, not really. Um, well, so there, well, there have been some people at the IETF that didn't think that BPF was, was the right fit because they're more used to standardizing like protocols and like packet formats and stuff. They're not really used to standardizing like JIT runtimes, right? It's a, it's a different, different approach for them. But um, so there were some people at the IETF that thought that didn't think it was a good idea. Um, you know, we're still there. Um, in terms of people in the industry, we haven't really gotten much pushback from anybody on that specific point. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think, it, I think it's not super surprising. I mean, it's for better, like even for pe even for people that don't really like BPF, it's just too big and it's, it, it, we need to, we need to standardize it at this point. I mean, the de facto standard right now is just whatever we do in the Linux kernel and everybody kind of follows along. Um, which is great for us, but uh, it's not really like conducive to growing a global global community around around the technology. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think everybody's okay with it. Yeah. So, um, give me a second. <laughs> happened again. No I had something. I lost it again. Um, what was I gonna say? Uh, right. So, considering the like the history the IECF has with the things that they've typically been involved in standardizing why specifically go through working with them so yeah we we thought about working with a few different people we thought about working with oasis which is what vertio went through mm -hmm. um we thought about doing uh just publishing the standard through the ebpf foundation which is a subsidiary of the linux foundation um uh they haven't standardized anything and um I think amongst the three, it's probably not controversial for me to say that IETF is definitely the most rigorous and has like the most kind of oversight and processes. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, you know, we 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 wanted it to be a good quality standard, and um, you can certainly do that with Oasis. It's nothing against Oasis, but we we just needed, you know, none of us had experience with standardizing anything, so we just needed the help. Like, um, uh, yeah, you know, we <laughs> we were talking about doing like ISO standards and all this stuff. Um, and uh, we, we, you know, we, we just didn't know what was involved at all. And so they, they were able to come in and kind of give us the standard side of it. And we got, we we're, were giving the technical side mm -hmm. and there are people that are thankfully experts in both that are, that are helping. Um, but more than anything, it was definitely just, uh, you know, the prestige of the organization, the, the, uh, the oversight they were willing to give us and kind of the handholding they were willing to do. And then ultimately just, you know, we thought it was going to be best for, for the community. Mm-hmm. So it's, you would say it's very much been a learning experience for you then, just trying to understand how how these standards even really, how you would even go about structuring it really. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like a lot of it, a lot of it is just doing what other people do, right? Like we, um, one of the things we were trying to come up with recently was uh, how should we group instructions, BPF instructions in a order called conformance groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that means is like, if you want to conform to a part of the standard, you have to you have to implement all of the instructions in this group or else you're not conformant and so do we group atomic instructions do we group division multiplication what do we do and we, we were bike shedding on this for a really long time and then finally i just went to the risk five standard and i was like we're just going to do a risk five does <laughs> okay like that's it um and i think that's actually not an incredibly dumb idea because you know a lot of hardware vendors are using risk five and so it makes sense risk five has conformance groups as well and so uh, that's sort of that's sort of well, what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, there's no point just imagining everything up yourself when nobody here has any experience with doing so. Like you, you can see what is already out there. You can take inspiration from that and just work from there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And hope that they had a good. They made a good <laughs> decision, and you're not just you know following in their footsteps. But... Well, hopefully, Thank hopefully you. in the case of Risk Five, at least. Uh... <laughs> Hopefully oh, yeah. that Risk, been done well. Extremely well thought out. Yeah, absolutely. So another thing that you um, mentioned in your email was a thing called uh, shared run queue. Oh yeah. So that was what I was talking. I briefly alluded to that when I was talking about this thing that I sent upstream that uh, mm -hmm. that does work conservation um, in the scheduler mm -hmm. and. So this is interesting. So I, I was saying earlier that you have this V runtime notion per CPU, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the the problem with that, the, the good thing about that is you can scale well because everything is happening in the 
the, the, the granularity of one CPU. So like you don't really contend very much and whatnot. But when you're doing load balancing, the problem with that is you have to iterate over all of these CPUs to like gather load and load balancing is really, is really expensive. And so there's, um, there are heuristics in the kernel where we don't even load balance at all if we think it's going to take too long and load balancing can decide not to do anything if it doesn't think it's worth it and all these things. And so shared run queue is a feature where per um, LLC cache, per LLC, per like essentially L3 domain, um, we have just a FIFO queue where when a thread wakes up or when it's in queued, uh, we put it into this, this shared run queue. And then anytime a core is going to go idle, it could just pull a task from that run queue, the shared run queue, instead of going through the whole load balancing path and doing the slow thing of iterating over every every CPU. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's that works well for workloads where you need really high work conservation, like like HHVM, the JIT, the, uh, JIT web engine that uh, Meta uses. Mm -hmm. um, it might not work quite as well for something where you're doing like, like really short bursts of work where you need to keep your L1 cache locality high and like migrating is just not worth the overhead and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of stalled. So there's four versions that have been sent upstream and I'm, I'm happy to send, I don't know if I sent you V4. I hope I did. Um, um I don't know, okay. but, uh, it's, it's stalled a little bit because the timing, like the EVDF has sort of changed the performance profile a little bit mm -hmm. and I just don't really have time to like go work on it. So some people at Google said that they were interested. So I just, I put the latest version, I think it was V4 up and. Um, I'll get back to it someday if I have time or somebody else can can pick it up and take it to the finish line. We have two links in here. Uh, patch v4, sked implement, shared run queue. Is that what I'd be looking for? That Yeah, that's got to be it. It's okay, got to be awesome. it. Yeah. Um, well, we're not going to have a look at all of it here. Cause it's just a text <laughs> dump. Of, I, I'll, save, yeah. I'll save reading a text dump of mailing list stuff for a video. Yeah, that's... A, <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, exactly. Right now. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so it's kind of in this like weird, not like upstream yet, but like, is it in a good state at least, or is it just? It's in a good. S Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, go on. Yeah, I, I was gonna say it is in a good state. It should work. Um, it should. It, it will do better than EVDF on a, on a good number of things, I think. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, like it could be merged I, unless there have been like merge conflicts. It could be merged and it should be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know. You, you have to like, it, the scheduler is so core in the system that a lot of the time you have to really have like kind of a bulletproof case for it, for something to get added. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's not, you know, it's just, it's, it's not going to work well for every workload. And so I think if it were to ever get merged, um, it might be that there are some things we could do to improve it. Like we could maybe have some better heuristics for if we actually don't do this, this migration and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, ultimately the people that, yeah, they're just going to have to accept that this isn't going to work well for every scenario. And it, it's, you know, you enable it when you want to use it. It's not actually enabled by default. It's um, in the in the core scheduler, there's something called sched features where you can dynamically enable and disable things at runtime. Um, and it's disabled by default. But even even then, it's it's just, you know, it hasn't been merged yet. It's interesting to hear you talk about kernel problems like that because it, it even at the kernel level, like there are the same sort of problems. Like, okay, this is just not gonna work for everybody, but something needs to get upstream. Like when I talk about like stuff in the Whalen project, for example, like there are very similar sorts of debates there. Like, okay, well, here's this very specific case where this doesn't actually address the problem. Well, here's this one group that doesn't want to do it. And it sounds like in the kernel, the same sort of challenges are still there. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's just software, right? The kernel is, is a hundred percent just software. Mm -hmm. The maintainership model makes things very interesting. No, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but, but yeah, you know, like, like there was another bug. I don't remember actually what, what the bug even fixed, but um, we had submitted a patch to the scheduler and it, uh, it took like two years for it to, to get upstreamed and it only got upstreamed when we were, I know, and this, this is just like a story. No, I, you say that once again, I'm just thinking of problems that happened in Wayland where it's taken like five years for protocols to be upstreamed. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And yeah, so you get it. I mean, in this case, we had to literally write a, like write a benchmarking tool that showed the problem. I'm sure in Wayland it's, it's similar. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure in every big... Well, the problem is just you have a project that has a lot of people. Like, you know, when you have a... When it's like a small application and it's just... We have... Like, when you just have a BDFL and what the BDFL says is what happens, 
mm-hmm. things go smoothly. But when you have, you know, 10,000 different cooks in the kitchen, the, you know, there's, there's going to be challenges there. There's going to be a lot of bike shedding. Uh, yeah, there will be. There will be. Um, so out of curiosity, so does, does Wayland, I'm not familiar with like the maintainership model. Do they have a BDFL or is it a, is so it a communal thing? They have the different desktops have different voting members. And they all have the ability to uh, knack different uh, protocols. So, I th- oh my god! If, <laughs> yeah, so if if there is a knack from one of the desktops, typically, typically it's from GNOME. Uh, if there's a knack from one of the desktops, that, if I'm recalling correctly, it cannot be in the xdg namespace which is the general namespace but it can still be in the ext namespace which is the extension namespace um and then there's the whole matter of before something can be upstream there needs to be implementations in at least three different uh three different desktops and three different projects uh, along with there being acts from three different projects as well like it's it's very much you know, there's a there's a lot of people that can vote on stuff, and when you have desktops that have fundamentally different approaches for how they want to do things, it can get complicated. Like right now, one of the uh, the big ones that people are arguing about. This is going to sound really stupid to you from from your perspective, <laughs> but there is this <laughs> argument over whether application, like whether application windows, should be able to set an icon for themselves along with. The, the children of that window having separate icons. So if you want to have like a settings window and that's going to have like a little settings cog, if you can set a little icon there that tells you it's a settings window and there is like a at least 500 message email thread arguing over whether this should be done, the format of the images, uh, whether, you know, how how we even do this, like what the protocol should look like. It's... It's an absolute mess. And that's just Dude. one of them. I, I could talk uh, about a messes all day with that project. I, I I actually think Wayland sounds worse than the Linux kernel. Like, I mean, I don't know the process at all, but we at least have BDFL, right? We have Linus. And mm-hmm. ultimately, his word is the word that, that matters the yeah. most. Um, <laughs> well, good luck. I Yeah. Is your... It gives I mean, me great content to talk about to. on the channel. Yeah, <laughs> happy to help. Do you think that they should be able to use their own icons and their children should be, should be able to define their own icons? Well, it, the, the thing is, it's it's trying to address a problem where the issue already was solved on Excel. So a lot of the issues we have are something can be done on Xorg, but now that we're moving to Wayland, it's like, okay, now we have an opportunity to change it and maybe do something better. The the issue is sometimes it's okay that wheels are round. Mm-hmm. You don't need to change the shape of a wheel. Uh, I think they should be able to. The issue, and th- there's a big discussion about how that should be done, like what the protocol should look like, and that's totally understandable. I don't, I don't see any any reasonable discussion happening around whether it should be possible. Like that, that's just insane <laughs> to me. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting way to frame it, though. That like should we, yeah, basically. The idea of building a new system is that you want to kind of get rid of some of the cruft from the old one, but then if you have, Xorg you have to get people to print, use it. It has a print server in it. You can print nice. your, your screen to a printer. <laughs> because I mean, it, it, that's... It, it, it treats the output device very generically, so it doesn't care what it is. Literally anything could be an output device. Oh, God. I'm glad I never got into that. I feel like I should, but I guess, yeah, I'll let you guys handle that. <laughs> I, look, I, I'm sh- I'm sure there's at least. I actually I I have said before that I feel like Wayland would go a lot better if there was a BDFL. You would have issues. Well, the issue you have there is if they align with what a lot of the users want because it seems like Linus generally steps in when people are just doing something stupid. Like it, it's at least for the most part, and then it would go like a big tirade, big phronic thread you get. <laughs> we all um, love those, yeah. <laughs> but. Um... Yeah, go, go on. What are you saying? Uh, well, yeah, I think so. He does step in when people are doing s- stupid stuff, but he also he does care about. I don't want to speak for Linus. I mean, he, you know, maybe I don't want to misrepresent him, but my sure. impression is that he he does care about how Linux is used. And so, if you have a if you have a tool that's like 
widely used like like you know um like the whole gke stuff with android and everything like that like there are times where he'll come in and he'll say like guys get figure out how to get this merge like mm -hmm. this it's it's enough is enough like it's just it's there's no point to like keeping stuff out of tree that's that's used everywhere right mm -hmm. like it, it should reflect upstream should roughly reflect how this is used in practice and so i think his voice of reason um, he's great because he's extremely obviously he's Linus Torvalds. He's very technically sound. Like he he knows he can read code very very well and understand every part of the OS. And I think he's a good manager of the project. I think, you know, it's yeah he does he does step in and kind of make make calls that are outside the scope of just technical stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you know even even so like he he's only one person right. So there's hundreds of thousands of lines of code that go into the kernel. So a lot of stuff goes in that he never even looks at. Mm -hmm. Um, and for us, I'd be curious how Waylon resolves these, but honestly, a lot of the time in the kernel, the way that you fix a problem is you go out and get beer with somebody at a conference and you have beers until two in the morning and you're like, oh yeah, okay. Like, oh no, we're, 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 we, we agree. We agree. And then the next day, you know, you send it and they merge it. So <laughs> it's funny you say that because Fostum just happened and all of a sudden half the issues that were, the people had with the icon thread suddenly like oh yeah so i actually talked to all these people and it's just like yeah it's not actually that big of a deal but <laughs> there's a lot of people that get very very heated and you know there's oftentimes there's not someone putting a stop to like people just throwing insults at each other and that that's where when, once that's happening then things have completely evolved you're not gonna get any progress being done because the second yeah. you insult someone that's when they're gonna be like nope i'm right don't care what you have to say you're wrong who cares yeah yeah when it gets personal it's it's problematic and that happens and that happens in the kernel obviously a lot as well and mm -hmm. it's it's it sucks i mean it's at the end of the day it's like a pr all of these things are fairly small communities right i know that Fostum is like a pretty big conference but mm -hmm. um yeah it is good like and linus can also he does chime in also for personal matters where he's like hey you know you're hard to work with like get your get your act together mm -hmm. um and yeah, I guess it sounds like Wayland could benefit from that, but I don't know. I mean, if half the if half of the thing the 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 issues on the the thread were solved with with beer, I know that beer is a core part of the Fostem uh, itinerary. That uh, it's a good sign. <laughs> Did you get to make it to Fostem? It cost me about three thousand dollars to fly over there. Um, that makes I've sense. From not, Australia. <laughs> I will get there eventually. Australia is just it's it's a difficult place to get anywhere really. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I might well, see if I can do like you know, go there, journalist funding at some point. We'll see We'll see if anyone's interested in doing that. I don't know what their sort of funding is like for that, but I know some of the other conferences definitely uh, do have funding in that regard. Um, so we'll see what yeah. happens. Totally, yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, the next IETF conference is actually in Brisbane in March, so I don't know how close that is to you, but <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> if you want to come get beer. Let's find out how much it costs. It's probably a couple hundred dollars to fly to Brisbane. Um, Bris uh, Adelaide to Brisbane flights it is about 270 dollars to get there oh section yeah you know maybe, maybe i'll go not to bad Brisbane. yeah it's uh it's it's not going to be the most i mean fostem is like way more interesting mm -hmm. you know ietf is like a lot of people arguing about like bike shedding about minutia and <laughs> protocols but it's still it's still fun you get to meet people mm -hmm. and uh and you know there's the uh there's the the, the beer reviews or whatever you want to call them that, that happened there too. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioning how Linus is kind of like this, this voice of reason. He's it. I, everyone sort of knows like over the years, he's very much, uh, I guess. Smoothened out. We'll say the, the way he, he interacts with people in the kernel. Cause you know, you, you go back to like nineties Linus, early 2000s. Like we've all seen the early emails that have, flown around in that thread they were just like absolutely tearing people apart like just cursing them out like what are you even doing in this project like get out um <laughs> i don't know if you i, I don't remember when uh, there was like rust support being uh, considered for the kernel um but back when that first got introduced there was a line of code and it was it was it should not have been they were using the standard rust library and if something went wrong, it, like, threw a, a panic, like, in kernel space, which is, like, no. And Linus yeah. responded, like, this cannot be here. Like, what are you doing? 
it, but like it was it's a lot more tame than it would have been like you know absolutely just cursing them out like all crazy things um i i think you know th i get why people didn't like the way linus used to act it makes a lot of sense but I, I I feel like there is some sort of benefit there having someone that is going to... Like, someone there needs to be separate and have that sort of oversight of what people are doing. You can't just let, you know... You can't just let people just blindly do what they're doing, especially on a project as big as the Colonel. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, you know, if there were ever a project where you want people not to make, like, horrible mistakes, it's in the Colonel, right? Because everybody has to deal with your problem if you do that. And, yeah, like, the panic thing... You know, it, it, it's it, the person, unfortunately, that that's indicative of somebody that doesn't really have experience with kernel work, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you can't do that. You can't just throw your hands up and like panic in the kernel. It's a very different environment. The, the kernel should never crash ever, 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 unless there's an actual bug in which case, okay, fine. You like limp to the finish line and crash. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, you know, you need to have real standards, right? Like, like the, one of the, one of the nice things about the kernel is that there's no manager like you don't have to report to anybody. Um, I mean, there, there are people that work in the kernel that have managers, so they, I guess they still have to kind of watch what they say, but it's, um, yeah, no, like many, many people don't work at the same company. And I think Linus having that sort of like, like you just can't BS him and like he won't let bad stuff in. Mm -hmm. It's a good culture. It's, it's, a good, it's a good culture to hand down to the maintainers mm -hmm. and have them apply it in their own ways. Um, I do think that, yeah, you know, he's, he, he's, he's, he does like, he is very direct in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. I think also he's like way humbler than I think I would be if I were in his position, like essentially like, essentially like as influential as Bill Gates or like Steve jobs or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of chills in Portland and just like, just like does code reviews for the Colonel, just kind of crazy. Um, but he's, so I, I'll give him credit for that. I will say my personal opinion is that I think, Kernel work is a little bit too, um, the community could be way more inviting to people. I think mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely a mystique of like, this is, this is like elite stuff and yada, yada, yada. I, I really believe that at the end of the day, it's just software and you just have, you kind of just have to understand like what your work, the area you're working in and then just build stuff like you would anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Maybe not just like you would, but it's pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that like culture of publicly shaming people kind of also has that effect. Right. And, you know, the effect ends up being that you filter out people that shouldn't be there by any means and people that really would, would provide value. And um, at the end of the day, you know, the kernel has been successful. And I think uh, I think even if we have filtered out people that that would, would have actually been great members of the community, clearly it hasn't like hamstrung us. Right. Like it's still a great kernel. So mm -hmm. the kernel is just this it's this weird project, right? Like, you know, just the fact that there's a mailing list you have to get involved with is the. Like the the bugzilla, which is kind of official, kind of not. There's some there's some maintainers that don't even like the bugzilla exists. Uh, I, I I've seen giant mailing list discussions arguing about the existence of the bugzilla. Um, just just the fact the mailing list is there, like that in itself is this weird thing that a lot of people just don't really have experience with. You know, Fedora has a mailing list, for example, and Ubuntu has theirs as well. But you know, if you're involved in just general user space stuff. Typically, the way you interact with a project is through, like, a GitHub or a GitLab bug tracker. So having to go through this, like, weird thing that you've probably never used, and then there's, like, specific etiquette on how you interact on the mailing list and all of this stuff, like, I I get why it's confusing. Then the fact that it's the kernel, right? Like, it it's this giant project with a million... I, I don't know how many lines of code it has now. Pro like, Definitely over, millions. Yeah, millions yeah. of... I, some will find the exact number and tell me what it is. Um, it's a very big project, and it can be hard to... Even on something smaller, like a, a desktop environment, it's hard to find like where your piece fits in, like what can you add to it. And I can only imagine that problem is even worse on the kernel. Once you're in there and you know that you can change it, I'm sure it's a lot easier to like work out what you can do there. But like just getting that first step in the door... I could imagine being really, really difficult. It is. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting because the whole mailing list thing, I think probably more than anything else is actually the biggest filter to people participating. And I think, I don't know if this is true or not, but I have to imagine that's kind of by design. But yeah, it, it's it's a little bit wonky. Like you do, you email people patches um, 
they reply to your email with code reviews and then eventually either they get dropped or the maintainer takes your patch that you emailed them and like merges it to their local repo and then eventually sends it to Linus and Linus merges it to his his repo, which is the actual like <laughs> upstream kernel. It's a really weird model. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, but you know, it, it works well. Um, I think if it is really hard to get started for sure, uh, you have to, you have to, first of all, learn a lot of like low level stuff. Like how do I even test? How do I build the kernel? How do I test it? Um, how do I configure it in the way that I want to test it? Oh, I have to like add this K config option to like compile nine P so that I can mount a look, a host file system and then like run tests. I mean, it's really complicated. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's that part of it, like the, the mailing list part and the, 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 like getting your rig set up kind of thing. Honestly, it's like probably a couple of weeks. I, I actually wrote a blog post on how to do the mailing list part. If anybody, um, wants to get involved to me, the, the, um, the, uh, the best thing that you can do if you do want to get involved is to just do code reviews, do like actual real substantive code reviews. Um, you know, if you if if there's an area that you're interested in, like MM or, or BPF or whatever, just follow follow the mailing list and kind of try to keep track of what people are doing. Like, read their their patch, their cover letters, which describe the feature. Try to understand how it works, and then when you start doing real code reviews and you can some, maybe submit some bugs and fix some few things like that, then you're kind of in the in the groove, you know. And and in in that regard, it's not that dissimilar, I think, from from any other project, but it is bigger for sure. And you have to, you have to just find a little piece of it and kind of like follow that piece and sort of start to build your, your repertoire from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I, I have to say this as well. Don't, if you want to send a patch to the kernel, you can definitely send like a documentation fix up or like a grammar or, or whatever fix up. Please don't do that more than once, maybe twice. There, there are people that send nothing but like moving commas around and like fixing spelling and stuff and like everybody knows who they are and everybody is like like eye roll like come on like please stop like it's so you know it's cool to have your it's obviously awesome to have your name in the kernel but um mm -hmm. but i think it's 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 uh the community kind of expects people that participate to have a substantive ability to participate and um mm -hmm. and you know like provide code value at the end of the day Right, that is that is understandable. I, the, the documentation one is weird because, like, someone you know, I, I I get wanting it to be like a substantive change, and I don't know, it, it it's weird, right? Like, because you see an issue with the documentation, and you do want it to be fixed, even if it's like a fairly minor one. But I I can get it from from that perspective as well, where it, especially if you are doing it a lot, like. It's yeah. I mean, it, look, it's it's val. I think it's. I personally think it's valuable for sure. Like, mm -hmm. especially if you're looking at a subsystem and you're like, do you're actually documenting it. Like, right, right, sure. Yeah, and there. So like, yeah, there, there's like a documentation subdirectory in the like a subtree in the kernel where like everything is documented. And you know, BPF has a whole bunch of stuff that could be better documented. Like, please feel free. I will act it. It'll it'll land. I promise you that. What I was talking about was more like people who like we'll fix a typo or like move like puncture, like fix grammar. It is like, I do think it's valuable, mm -hmm. but people know that you're just doing it to like get your patches in, you know, and it's, it does have a cost because you do have to have like people with very limited bandwidth review these things and whatever. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's hard to describe. Like some of the people that do this also like will like engage in code reviews, like kind of con like in a confrontational way and be like, you need to document this, and it's like, you know what? No, <laughs> you have no you have no right to, to, to demand anything of me at all. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I don't want to mis misrepresent anything. Um, mm -hmm. It's good. It's it's fine. It's good work. I like again. I think it's valuable. It's just you're dealing with people that are that are kind of cynical by default, mm -hmm. and they're not going to assume good intent if like you keep you keep doing it. You know, they're right. just going to assume that you're like an attention wannabe whatever sure sure yeah no i, yeah. I get it it's a, a fairly similar thing happens around um october with hacktoberfest with a lot of github repos so you get these a ton of repos just getting these like very tiny changes because you know some years they'll give out shirts for example if you have a, a commit made so it ends up with a lot of projects being like ah oh, here's a comma change here's this here's that actually a really bad one i saw like 
this this was insane. There was a uh, a YouTube channel. I think they had like six million subs, and they got like a one and a half million uh, views on the video. They were teaching how to use GitHub, right? Totally understandable. And sh they showed how to make a pull request, issues, and all that. They showed how to do it on an actual real repo on ExpressJS. They, oh. they they use that repo, and if you go to their repo, there is hundreds of uh, pull requests being made with people are just adding their name to the README. It's what? Like, yeah. Oh, that sucks. That's super annoying. Yeah, I mean, that's that's unfortunate because it's like it's actually I, I don't know I haven't seen the video, but I assume that they made like they a somewhat say... substantive pull request, right? No, that's the thing. The video didn't either. No. So in oh, the the, the video, they just added the name of the college they were at. Um, oh, that's poor judgment. Yeah. Yeah. They did say after the fact, don't do this. But the problem is when you have one and a half million views, you're gonna have a subset of those people who just actually go and do it. Oh man, that would be like extremely bad. At the <laughs> that would take down the kernel email servers if people did that. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, exactly. Like, and I, I, it's, it's, it's sad because like you get it right. I mean, so the hot, the Hacktoberfest thing, I guess like, to your point, like you actually get like shirts sometimes and people will submit absolute nonsense. I'm sure. And mm -hmm. I'm sure they even say this is nonsense. I just want a shirt in some of the yeah. PRs, yeah. Yeah. but, um, but yeah, so it's understandable that people want to want to have their names on stuff, but at, after a certain point, like you, like, I don't know. Like, I don't think it means that much for, for somebody to have their name in the kernel. Like, I don't know. I know people that have never submitted a patch to the kernel that have like much deeper systems experience than like some of the people that only submit documentation patches, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to pick on documentation. I'm just saying like it's right. at, at a certain point, like I think for you as a person, the royal you, obviously, it's, it's like you're, you're going to want to kind of participate more meaningfully anyways. Mm -hmm. So usually I do this at the start, but I, I guess we just didn't do it. Uh, what's your background in programming like, and how did you actually find yourself doing this kind of work? So I, I majored in math in college, um, and I kind of realized like towards the end of my, my uh, undergrad degree that I wasn't going to be a mathematician, um, <laughs> which I'm glad that I figured that out young enough where it wasn't a problem. Um, so I took a web dev course and I got a job as a web developer at Columbia University um, for my first job. And uh, I did that for a few years. And then I, um, I got into to grad school and did my master's in, in grad school. Um, I thought I was going to be more like a graphics machine learning person because I had a math background. But it turns out that I really wasn't supposed to be a mathematician. And so I... <laughs> I ended up finding that the operating system stuff was way more interesting to me. Like, like how does, uh, you know, I was just, I like asking the question, how does this work at the end of the day? And that's kind of the only question that really matters in operating systems. It's not true, obviously, but you know what I mean? Um, and so anyway, so I was more interested in that. Um, I took more, like way more OS courses at that point. And um, I really liked my kernel course in particular. Uh, we had to build like a full 32 bit x86 kernel, which was a good exercise. Um, Everything other than the boot lo bootloader, which I'm, I'm glad they didn't force us to do that. Um, and so my first job out of grad school was working at VMware. Um, I was on the core, core kernel team there for a little while, and then I was on the core hypervisor team. Um, both extremely the, the amazing engineers on those teams. I really learned a lot from them. Um, and then, but I hadn't really done much open source work. I kind of wanted to, but I had done like some web developer open source stuff, but nothing, nothing like to write home about. Um, and then, yeah, I went to Meta. I worked on a uh, an internal thing for a little while that, that ended up getting canceled. And then uh, the Linux kernel team, thankfully, was hiring. So I switched over to there. And that's that's kind of how I ended up in this, this situation. Um, but yeah, so TLDR, uh, web dev to grad school to OS to kernel work in industry. It's kind of how it played out. Oh, so the kernel work started when you were already there? Uh, when I was at Meta, when I like entered yeah. Meta. Yeah, yeah, I'd been doing kernel work for quite a while at that point. Yeah. Okay, okay. It it was more related to to like virtualization because I was working at VMware, so the problems were like, oh, we have like VMs migrating between NUMA nodes, like let's migrate memory with them, whatever stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all I, it's all the same at the end of the day, really. Mm -hmm. It's like like there there was an article that came out recently on LWN about um how there's NUMA NUMA text replication is something that people are trying to do, and just a very brief overview of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
each so like when you're talking about a big computer if you ever heard the term multi-socket that's if you have like two numa nodes is really what multiple numa nodes is what's going on and essentially what that means is there's like there are different pl places where you have pockets of ram that are closer to certain sets of cores and so you want to read from the the memory that's closer to your cores and um, one of the things that people want to do right now in the kernel is replicate the kernel code and read only data to all of these NUMA nodes. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we did a way, like way long ago um, on the, the hypervisor side, at my previous company. So, um, you know, people play catch up. It's very, it's different, very different problem in Linux because you have like live patch and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard to do this sort of synchronously, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, the skills, the skills translate for sure. Mm. So you've had a fairly interesting career, I, I guess it's fair to say then. It feels like it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's certainly been a wild ride. I mean, I, I definitely didn't expect to be working on the Linux kernel team um, mm -hmm. at Meta, but, uh, but you know, it's been an awesome experience. Um, yeah, um, kernel work, it's, it's wild. Uh, I'm glad I'm here, but... You know, we'll see. I don't know if I'm going to want to do kernel work for my whole career either, because it's it's a it's a pretty specialized space, and I think mm -hmm. you are somewhat limited in what you can do at the end of the day as well. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just don't realize how many like how much of the kernel is developed, like from people at companies like Meta. Obviously, people know obviously the Red Hat stuff that's there, but like a lot of you know Amazon does a lot of work in the kernel, Nvidia does a lot of work in the kernel, AMD, uh, just say Amazon. Maybe I did. Intel does a lot of work on the kernel. Like most of, yes, there is a lot of people who are like volunteers who are doing kernel work, but a lot of the work is also being done. And would the kernel would not be able to be in the state it's in today if it wasn't for the support it gets from these companies as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, for Meta in particular, uh, a lot of the, the bigger maintainers are on the team, like. Um, the uh, the multi queue like the block maintainer Jens Axbo and I O U Ring he's on the team uh, the uh, the C groups maintainer and actually now this, the other SCADX guy he's on the team mm -hmm. so there's there and you know like Meta I think I don't I can't really speak for other companies but for Meta at least they are given a lot of time to be maintainers like mm -hmm. one one could even argue that a certain large percentage of their 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 salaries are basically just donations to the Linux kernel community and there's like no expectation that they do anything um a lot of their work there's no expectation that it has to even have any benefit to meta whatsoever mm -hmm. so yeah you know i think it's i know that people there are people that have different opinions and that's i understand it that's fine but absolutely it wouldn't there's no way the kernel would be anywhere near where it is today if you didn't have companies throwing tons of of engineering resources at it and you know yeah, I think it's a good thing personally. Like it's it's these, you know, engineers aren't cheap, so it's good to get good to put them in an environment where they can they can contribute back to a, to an open source kernel. Mm -hmm. Well, we can kind of imagine where it would be because there is sort of a good example of it and that's something like the herd kernel, which as which was, you know, very exciting back in the late 80s and early <laughs> 90s and then every, even in the early I don't know how much you've read like the early Linux mailing yourself, or this is just me being crazy, just reading things that don't matter. Uh, but there was a even after Linux came out, and there was clearly a lot of excitement around. Like even after Debian came out, people were like, "Yeah, okay, this is going to be temporary until the herd kernel is ready." <laughs> and then yeah. the herd kernel, I think they're just getting sixty-four bits uh, support in like the last year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And it, like, I, I think it's like, it's great, right? Like it's a cool project. It's sure. fun. But at the end of the day, yeah. Like you have to just invest like these kernels, the, these open source projects need, need companies to sponsor people to work on them. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, th there was an LWN article recently that talked about um, how after the whole, uh, what was it? The log 4 J thing. I forget what the, uh, the name of the library was where like, yeah, there was that yeah, horrible yeah. zero day vulnerability. Um, you know, like, should companies be paying maintainers to work on these core libraries, uh, or should the government? Yeah, should the government should companies? I think I, I I personally think companies should. I think that you know, like, if you're if you have uh, if you have a company that's like that needs this tool, then you know you should pay somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I I'm, I don't want to like re be reductive and like simplify it, but I think. At the end of the day, the, the really good big projects usually do have company sponsorship for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I don't know. I mean, a lot of really great ones don't too. I don't want to be reductive, but it's, sure. uh, it's just like, you know, if you were building a project, like you would want everybody to be using it and everybody to be contributing. Right. And that's kind of how it goes for, for Linux. And the nice thing is like, you know, Linus, Greg, Greg Crow Hartman, all these folks work for the Linux foundation. They have no, absolutely zero tie to like any of the other companies beyond their, their relationship with the engineers who maintain the subsystems. And so, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, there is still like an, a very deep element of impartiality. Like Linus is not going to accept something from anybody at Meta if he thinks it's dumb or if he doesn't think it belongs. And you don't have to look very far back to see him like blowing up at people that have like a lot of influence um, on the community that work in Meta. So it's, I think it's a healthy balance, but you know, I, I see everybody's side. <laughs> I, I see both sides of the uh, the argument. <laughs> You mentioned there. Um, there's always these like little things, these great projects that don't have any funding. That are just like you know, buy one go or whatever. You have web dev experience. I'm sure you've seen you know very critical libraries that are used by every company out there. That you know, one dude just maintains by himself. That it's like ten layers down the dependency stack that you know everybody needs, but no one even knows it exists. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's that is really you're right. That's a, that's a problem. And like, I don't know. Like, even if you were to have the government pay for people to work on that, which would also be great, and they deserve to be compensated. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you do if you don't even if like nobody even knows that it's actually sitting that low, right? Right. It's but yeah, it's it's totally. I totally agree with you. It's not as simple as I don't know. <laughs> And you know, log4j was was a recent one, but there is mm -hmm. so many more for yeah. sure. And but you know, the other part of it is like a lot of these core libraries, even even if the person that's that's maintaining it has all the time in the world, like it's their judgment of as to what gets merged too, right? right? And like if you're if you're like a maintainer for OpenSSL and you you accept something, you're like, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden, like you have some stack overflow or like you can read arbitrary memory from on, on the NIC, then like that's not great. Yeah. Um so to me, there, there's a certain element of like um, house of cards-ness to the tech industry that's kind of never going to go away. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. For, it would be nice for the people that do that to at least be compensated for sure. I'm sure you've seen the the XKCD. The uh, yeah, what number? I don't With know like, what number it was. It was like the teeny little like block holding yeah. up that huge. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, where is it? I I had looked at it just the other day, and now I'm not going to be able to find it. Am I? Uh, there was a. Oh, I think I got it. Y yes, if you... it's two three four seven. Okay, thank you. I... Yeah. Okay, CD. Okay, let's see. Uh, so. Is that it? Is that how their website works? Yeah. XKCD, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So all modern uh, <laughs> digital infrastructure, all these like complicated little applications, a project some random uh, person in Nebraska has been thankfully maintaining since 2003. It's holding everything up. Yeah. And it's tr it's absolutely true. I mean, at least with the kernel, like it's all very well, like the maintainership is documented in this maintainer's file and like, it's there are drivers that everyone's like who's maintaining that you know like there's a lot of code but um but it's well documented but yeah i mean the kernel is a kernel right like it's not user space where you have everything that's actually used on the system that's building up your whole ecosystem and so <laughs> yeah it's it's unfortunate for sure I, um, I did do a video on there was this i don't remember what the exact product was but there was this intel like some weird intel hardware that came that came out in 2008 they had a driver for it in the kernel some intel devs did work on it no one is sure this hardware actually exists so <laughs> they got the patches in there before it released publicly and they must have canned the project uh so someone was like does anyone actually have this can we just get rid of this like it <laughs> nobody's was maintaining it nobody knew what it did or like why it was still here and it's just random like Obviously, yeah, the kernel is well maintained, but there are going to be those parts where, you know, nobody's touching it. Or like a, a little while back, there was this culling of a bunch of random old Wi-Fi hardware, like, um, like 802.11a hardware and stuff like that. Where it's just like, is anybody actually still using this? Like, can we? Do we need this here? Can we get rid of it? Is anyone sure it works? Because like, it's, it's hardware that nobody even knows if any like. 
if a kernel maintainer has. Like, nobody can test it. Nobody's sure if it's still working. It's like, so... It, and they were saying, yeah. well, yeah, if, if somebody has the hardware, please speak up and we'll keep it around if it's still working. But, like, you know, if nobody's using it at this point, like, there's, there's no reason to keep it around. Like, um, yeah. a couple years back, there was a discussion about dropping... I'm surprised it's still supporting the kernel, but support for the uh, Intel 486. <laughs> and they're like, is anybody actually running a modern kernel on a 486? You I... know, <laughs> probably is the sad answer to that question, though. And the, yeah, like it's 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 tough because the the process for getting rid of it is exactly what you just said. Like, you kind of ask timidly, like, is anybody using this? Like, hoping nobody says anything, and then you may you remove it. And sometimes people are like, look, you can't remove that. Like, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you get some rando that hey, said, hey, this broke my this broke my build, and you have to leave it in, right? Like. The 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 um the kind of like golden rule of Linux is you can't break user space, you can't break old devices or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean the Intel story is pretty funny. I wonder if that was um if that was the uh, oh what was that feature called where they had like the uh, they had like the the secure oh secure enclaves SGX that might have been it. Mm. I think that got canceled. I don't recall. But yeah, that's um, funny. That's such an Intel thing to happen because they like their whole business model at this point practically is just having accelerators like do stuff faster than cpus and mm -hmm. yeah that that story that story checks checks out for sure with the the wi-fi one i believe one of the drivers that was on the block for culling was the ps3 wi-fi driver and that's <laughs> one where people did speak up like yeah no I, i'm still running uh, i'm still running a modern kernel on a ps3 like sure why not okay go <laughs> ahead <laughs> i mean the so the nice thing about like the uh, the driver model, I think is pretty good with Linux. Where the policy is, if you haven't upstreamed your driver, then you get no backwards compatibility guarantees at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't really actually have any ABI requirements for the drivers in the kernel, which is really nice because in, in kernels where you do have that, it can be extremely painful. But then the flip side of that, of course, is that if you have an upstream driver, then you do have these guarantees, and that's why you're like, okay, I want to like change something that's really dumb to do something that's way less dumb, but okay. PS3 needs it. <laughs> um, so it has its drawbacks. I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, I, 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 you'd, you'd have to hope that like at a certain point, I don't know. I mean, I was going to say, we'll come up with a policy that's like you deprecate devices after like some number of decades, but 486, like, I don't know. So it's, it's, it's going to be a problem for the foreseeable future for sure. Well, Deprecation is a weird, run, uh, weird one, right? Because you can deprecate stuff, but then there's the issue of can you actually remove it? A recent example I saw was um, with grep, most systems ship fgrep. fgrep and egrep. These are technically been deprecated for the past 20 years, but nobody knows they're deprecated, and specifically they're only deprecated in the GNU project. So people just keep using them. There are distros that are still shipping them today, and there's this argument like, okay, it's deprecated, but well, can we remove it now? But like, there's all these scripts that use it, and it's it's one of these things where it's like, I I th when I was younger, I thought deprecation was a lot easier of a problem. But the second you realize that, and this was the same problem that was uh, people worried about with Y2K, when there are people that are running the, your software on thirty year old like installations and have not changed anything in that long and it's still in deployment like it's hard to make changes if they're still using the modern stuff yeah totally i mean it's i i, I it's funny because i feel like i had the same exact scenario like the same exact kind of arc where i was like you just just like deprecate it for a long time and then if people complain like just tell them to deal with it but well, I don't remember at all what the actual issue was, but do you remember like in the last year or so, GitHub had that huge outage because they like deprecated some, like, I think it was some, some kind of like encryption algorithm they were using. I really don't recall exactly what it was, but they it were like, familiar. yeah, but they were like deprecated, deprecated, like change, 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 like email, email, email. And then they, they flip it off and like 90% of the, the world, like, can't connect to github anymore and like of course they revert it right and there's i forget what the rule is but there's some like just like with what moore's law or whatever like there's some law where like once something is sufficiently large like you can't undo it and i think 
the kernel is like and really suffers from that because it's the core of the the core of the operating system but mm -hmm. um yeah it's a really really difficult problem and um the only person who can really force the issue is, is linus at the end of the day mm -hmm. and if you have a user that's going to email the list and say i'm using this i mean yeah it's 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 pretty fat chance that linus is going to override them unless there's like a really good reason to yeah like it's yeah. you know causing some issue in something newer that more people are using and things things of that nature i would assume yeah yeah like this is preventing us from like I don't know, like using 64 bit memory, like some, something like that. Sure. Like there, there isn't anything like that, but it's yeah. Or what you said too. I mean, it's, it's just really, really rare. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, and actually that's, that's another interesting point. If we bring the discussion back to SCEDX. Mm -hmm. So another one of the big challenges that modern maintainers have in the kernel is dealing with something called UAPI constraints. And UAPI is the term for, um, for the part of the kernel that's, that's essentially the user space visible interface. So if you have like header files where you can link against them and like make system calls or whatever, or some like ABI, some structure that has certain byte layout that has fields that mean a specific thing, that you can never change. I mean, you can change it if Linus lets you, but it's really, 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 really hard to change. And like you basically have to assume that you can't change it ever. So maintainers are all are very understandably guarded for new stuff that's being added to UAPI. Like it's a very, very high bar. And even if something is a great, feature, they might just feel like, I can you know, I don't want to maintain this. It's going to take too much time. Mm -hmm. So one of the nice things about BPF is that, um, especially in the modern version of BPF, uh, because the schedulers or whatever BPF program you load is a kernel program, there's no UAPI constraints at all. And this thing, this thing can talk, the, the program can talk to user space over those, the maps, the data structures I was talking about. Mm -hmm. There is a user space component. But the maps themselves are UAPI. So like the structure of how you share this array with user space, all of that's UAPI. But the the actual like communication itself isn't, right? Like you use the array however you want for whatever program and the actual whatever, the, the communication channel is completely outside the scope of UAPI. So mm -hmm. BPF, one of the things that makes me excited about it is it's going to, I think it's kind of the way forward for the kernel to be extended without having to tie the hands of, um, of, of all these maintainers that like don't want to have to add UAPI, mm -hmm. but still extend it and still have something that actually performs better anyways, because that's it's in the kernel. So um, yeah, that's that's just another another kind of nice thing about SCEDX. Mm -hmm. There's one last thing I want to touch on, but I will be back in uh, just a moment. Sure. Uh, I didn't actually stop the recording. I'll just cut that bit out. <laughs> yeah, that's, I figured that. That's fine. <laughs> I, I did stop the recording with the last person I had, and then I forgot to upload. I forgot to clip on that part that I cut out, so then I had to upload that separately. Uh, we're not doing that this time. Um, okay. Because <laughs> people are going to yell at me again for not uploading the ending. Um, the Something we touched on at the start and didn't really expand much upon past that was you also have the uh, the Twitch channel you have. 
and you're gonna start oh, using yeah. that to do stuff yeah yeah thanks thanks for bringing that up um yeah you know it's it's something i started fairly recently um i thought that people might be interested in so watching like watching me work on the kernel in real time mm -hmm. uh answer questions that folks have um and yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's engineering, so it's not always interesting to just watch, but, uh, but I think it's, it's an element of, of the tech industry that doesn't really get much ironically, cause it's so core, it doesn't really get as much attention as it should have. So mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, it's a way for me to just like chat with people, show people what I'm doing, kind of show them how, how the kernel works, do some deep dives on, um, on various subsystems, like the scheduler, BPF, RCU, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, you know, just open, open, open forum for people to ask questions and, uh, and participate however they want to. I think having something like this actually is really cool because it does give people an insight into the way the kernel actually works, the way it's developed. Like it's not, ac it, it's, it's j like, yes, it's C code, but it's just C code. Like it's not this, this crazy thing that you can't. You, you that you can't modify like you can see the code here like it's if you understand c like you can once you start understanding like what specific variables refer to what where functions are located things like that like you can like piece it out and start making sense of it you you, you absolutely can and i think you know you i think you were right when you said earlier that like this this huge hill to climb when you first start is that you feel like there's this this literal like mountain of code that you can't even see, like it goes into the, into like the clouds. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's true. But what you can do if you have somebody that's, that's, you know, that's, that's there to explain it to you, they can, they can explain conceptually what big pieces of this thing are doing. And then everything else is an abstraction, right? Like, Oh, I want to add a BPF feature. Okay. I'll tell you exactly what I'll explain BPF. I'll do a deep dive in kind of the, the background of it. And then I'll tell you what this specific type of object does. And then you'll realize, oh, there's a lot of different types of these things that we actually could add that would be really useful that actually wouldn't even really require a lot of expertise to add. <laughs> um, and I think you know the kernel, the community in the kernel is 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 a uh, they're they're they've been around for a while, right? Like it's it's a lot of like experienced people that maybe they want to retire soon, maybe not, you know. But it's it is definitely an older demographic, and I think it's. I think it's important for the Linux kernel community to start to kind of grow into the younger generation as well. Um, and I think, unfortunately, one of the big drawbacks is that there isn't really this like this this sort of this sort of vision into it, right? You kind of have to just jump into the super deep end and figure stuff out. But it doesn't have to be that way. I'm kind of trying to make it maybe not that way a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not sure uh, I'm not sure uh, if it'll work out or not. But for now, it's been really fun. The community's growing, and um, yeah, it's a fun place to hang out. I've tried to do programming streams before, but I I get way too distracted by people talking. Like I, I can't do it. You know, I, I feel like I have to have I have to be working on something that's like really easy to reason about. Like I I can't be like debugging a scheduler thing. Although we actually did debug um a, a kernel bug in real time, which was a fun stream. Um but yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, it's it's like, but that's the fun for me. That's the fun of it. Like people, I'll like talk and do some stuff, and then people ask questions, and we'll kind of go on a tangent for a while, and then people mm -hmm. ask questions about the questions. Um, but usually, when I do a stream at this point, I'll have like some kind of um, some kind of plan for it. Like the other day, I showed people how Stack Overflows work and gave like an example of how to write a Stack Overflow. Um, and so it wasn't really kernel work; it was kind of just systems systems oriented, you know. But um, but that was useful. It was like, it was kind of organized enough that I I felt like if people were asking questions, I wasn't like, the the whole like big picture in your head of the system that you're trying to reason about doesn't like, get toppled over, which obviously does happen if if uh, if you're working on something that's kind of too complicated. Yeah, yeah. Well, even for me, it's not some it's not just something that's too complicated. I just I just cannot when I when I want to do any sort of programming work, I need to be like locked in. I don't want any distractions. I don't even particularly like listening to music when I, I program. Like I I'd honestly want to have earplugs in. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I should try that, man. Um yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Uh yeah. Um my wife and I had to set up a system where I would put I have like a do not dis or an on air neon sign hanging outside my office door, and she's like, "Okay, like <laughs> he's on air, whether he's on air or not." Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's it can be really tough. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly to your point. Like I just I, I usually 
work in areas that I have like a lot of, I feel very comfortable in. And it's, it's usually just an educational thing, even more than like breaking ground on like a big new thing. Right. Right. No, there are there are a couple of other people that do these like very in depth streams. Like the person who works on um, Asahi Linux to the the work to get mm. um, the M1, M2, the Apple Silicon Max like working. That she streams all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, which You're talking is, about Hector Martin, right? Yeah, uh, Hector, and then also we have Asahi Lena doing that work. Oh, I haven't seen any of of, of those streams. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we have, like, there's people doing this kind of work, and there's some people that are really good at it. And, you know, if you can find a way that makes it work, if you're in the way, a way that you feel like it's, um, it's, it's, like, useful to people seeing it, like, I, honestly, I think it's worth, like, just experimenting with and just see what happens with it. That's the plan. Yeah, that's the plan. Uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. It's, uh, I feel like I have more work than, like, there, there's, there's an infinite amount of, content is the nice part it's millions of lines of code and it's always changing and growing so i think it's fun um yeah you know we'll see somebody like so somebody like hector martin i mean he's so knowledgeable about mm -hmm. stuff too that like i think he he literally can hack on like really complicated stuff and like it's trivial for him and he can talk about it mm -hmm. for that i don't think that'll be <laughs> i could do that in my stream necessarily right maybe but um yeah mine i, I think it's if i had to guess it's probably going to be more educational and um i might i might do like youtube and make make educational videos as well mm -hmm. um that's the that's the the rough plan but you know we'll see we'll see how it works out so if you want to check that out where can they go to find you they can go to twitch.tv slash byte lab that's byte b-y-t-e underscore lab um that's probably the best place to start for now and you can do twitter uh, twitter.com slash byte lab as well mm -hmm. awesome yep um I think we've touched on pretty much. <laughs> uh, okay, Jitsi died. Uh, lovely. This happens sometimes. Hey, I think uh, I lost you for a second. <laughs> yeah, no, this happened the last time I used Jitsi as well. I think it's because the call was going. It just yeah, it just hit the two hour mark. That's why. Oh, interesting. What happens at two hours? Apparently, it kicks me from the call, and okay, now there's two fun. of me, which is fun. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, I guess we should probably uh, end it off now, unless there's anything else you want to say. We've sort of touched on everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, I think that was it. Yeah, thank you so much for for inviting me on the podcast. I had a really good time, like lots of really, really interesting, deep questions. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, I think Hope everybody I'll, enjoys watching it. I think some of it went a bit over my head. Um, I, I try to keep up mo as much as I could, but you know, it, this is a complex area to deal with for sure. It is. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's, yeah, I, I, I'm sure if, if it went over your head, it's because I, it's just, there's just no learning this stuff without staring at it for a long time. Right. But um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to clarify in the comments or or uh, come come ask me on the stream, and I can clarify as well. Awesome. Um, I guess uh, we already mentioned the Twitch. But if there's anything else you want to shout out, anything you want to direct people to, um, let them know. Yeah, you know, for now, for now, just just Twitch and, and Twitter, are the two. I'm like I said, I'm gonna start doing YouTube. Um, that's the plan at least. Uh, but. For now, that's kind of where all the content is going. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I haven't posted anything yet. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there, there, oh, there's also a Discord channel as well that doesn't have an easy to pronounce link. So I don't is really know Is that linked on your Twitch or your Twitter, somewhere like that? It is on, yeah, so that's a good call out. It is on the uh, the, 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 uh, the Twitch. So okay. um, just go there and people can find the, uh, the link to join. Awesome. Oh, did the, no, the other me didn't leave yet. Okay. I th oh, there it is. There okay. You. It okay. left on your side. And okay. Now we're good. Cool. <laughs> Whatever. Jitsi will be Jitsi. Um, <laughs> is that is that all you want to mention? Uh, if it is, I'll do my outro. Uh, that is all I wanted to mention. Yeah. Thanks again for your time. Awesome. Uh, okay. So if you want to see more of my stuff, the main channel is Brody Robertson. I do Linux videos there six ish days a week. Uh, I have no idea what'll be out by the time this comes out, because this is kind of getting recorded a bit ahead of schedule. 
um i've got like three episodes backlogged so we'll be out march sometime um if you want to see my gaming stuff i do gaming streams over on twitch at broody on games uh i've probably close to finishing both games by now so just check what's over there you'll see what's over there i have a react channel if i watch things on the stream I upload them there. Do not expect good content. Do not expect well-researched content. Do not expect anything that's worth watching. But if you would like to see me ramble about nonsense, which is what I normally do, it's just less scripted nonsense, uh, check that out. And if you're listening to the audio version of this, you can find... I, the Radio Optimus Reacts, that's the channel. Um, and if you're listening to the audio version of this, you can find the video version on YouTube at... Tech Over T. If you're watching the video, you can find the audio on any podcast platform. Search Tech Over T. There is an RSS feed. You will find it. T stick in your favorite app and you'll be good to go. Give the final word. What do you want to say? Uh, keep hacking. Keep it low level. Keep it real. And uh, yeah, hope to see everybody in the future at some point. Awesome. See you guys later. <laughs>